Welcome back, dear listeners, to another episode of Be Inspired, your ultimate resource for finding inspiration and a place where we dive into the stories and insights of creative individuals who have forged their own paths and found inspiration in unexpected places. I'm your host, Francesca, and today we have the pleasure of welcoming a truly inspiring artist, Audra Townsend. Now, if I might share a little bit about Audra. She is a free-spirited, British-born, Jamaican-Canadian, abstract, and mixed-media artist who just so happens to be based right here in Toronto. And her work is a testament to the power of creativity in overcoming life's challenges and embracing one's true self. Audra's belief in art as a manifestation of human curiosity has led her to explore the intricate relationship between creativity and I would say the human experience. As a trained sociocultural anthropologist, she brings a rich understanding of societal dynamics and cultural nuances into her artistic expression. It was interesting to learn her journey into the world of art actually began as a means to overcome writer's block of all things and social anxiety that evolved into a profound exploration of identity and self-acceptance. She uses this intuitive and tactile art form to reflect her deeply personal approach to creativity inviting viewers to experience art in a way that goes way beyond the visual. We'll hear more from Audra about her artistic process, from the initial spark of inspiration to the finished piece, and we'll explore how she transforms her perceived disadvantages into unique advantages, crafting artwork that is as authentic as it is captivating. I'm sure this podcast is going to leave you feeling inspired and uplifted. So let's get started. Welcome, Audra. How are you? I'm good. And uh, (laughs) thank you for having me. You're so welcome, Audra. I know that was a really long introduction, but did I miss anything? (laughs) Oh, no, that, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> you're so welcome. Okay, well, if you're ready, let's get started because I have lots of questions for you. So let's dive deep. Here we go. So, Audra, you've described your art as a manifestation of human curiosity about the material world. So can you share with us just a little bit about how you see this connection between art and our innate curiosity. To to start, what I would have to say first is um, that we never just approach a canvas um, with a blank state of mind. Mm, Okay. Always, 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 always thinking about something. As an artist, I'm thinking about uh, um, what has just occurred in my day. Maybe there was something that um, Mm. um, caught my attention. Uh, Maybe it was something in the news Mm -hmm. that um, had an impact on Mm. me and... um, how you know you know it changed my perspective of the world or something like that there's Mm -hmm. always always something that uh, you are approaching your work your canvas Mm -hmm. um with like you're never a blank slate it's not a blank slate so you're saying there's always something that inspires you to put on canvas it might not be inspiring (laughs) okay It, it might be something that is um a problem mm, to okay. solve. Okay. Okay. Be um, a worry, a 
fear, mm. anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so when you, you come to the canvas, there's mm -hmm. something there that you are working with. There's, um, I'm calling it a spectrum. There's this, um, like an, an invisible <laughs> right. thing is uh, driving your motivation to paint. Something invisible that you bring into being is, I think, what you're saying as well, yeah? So when you think about it, mm -hmm. art is how we express our experiences in the material world. Mm -hmm. um, whatever we experience on the outside, we internalize, and then we are, I'm going to say, problem-solving in a way, mm -hmm. in order to understand what has just taken place. And... Um, that connection, uh, art and our curiosity is essential to what it means to be human. When you think about that, think about cave paintings. What did the first humans uh, paint? They were painting about their hunting expeditions, eh? Wild animals. They were painting about um, uh, flowers, mm. you know, different mm -hmm. um, plants and you name it. And their hand, uh, my famous is this uh, cave painting in uh, the south, I think it's the south of France, I can't remember what it's called, but it's pretty famous, cave paintings with the handprints, eh? Mm -hmm. And I think, I'm not quite too sure what materials they were using in order to do it, but they were blowing, they had the paint in the mouth and just blowing the paint right. um, around their hands to get almost like a stencil um type of an image of their mm -hmm. hands. Mm -hmm. It's our curiosity. Like um, art and creativity is what makes us human. We, 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 we are ingesting the outside world. We are um, thinking about it, trying to understand it. And um, our way of doing that is through problem solving. And creativity is basically problem solving. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you are a self-taught artist with a background in sociocultural anthropology. So tell us how has your academic training then influenced your artistic style and the themes you explore in your work? I, I um, okay, so that is a really good question. Um, my anthropology training is basically the lens in which I view the world. Mm -hmm. so, so it has an impact. It, it will never go away um, after, you know, undergraduate <laughs> studies and graduate studies in anthropology. That's the lens. That's how I view the world. Okay. To explain, okay, my field of anthropology mm -hmm. is uh, called social cultural anthropology, which studies humanity from a holistic perspective. It mm. studies human diversity while also looking for what makes us um, all, um, all the same. And uh, when you think about uh, what makes us the same, you have to think in terms of like the social structure. Um, mm -hmm. uh, different cultures have social structures. Um, well, they, 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 yeah, all cultures have uh, social structures. There's a historical perspective to the culture. There's a political perspective. There's a, an economic, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And there's ideas, you know, from all of those things, different ideas, behaviors, and norms um, shape. The individual who belongs within those uh, different uh, societies and what people need to think about is their structure the social the historical the political economical shapes the ideas and behaviors of individuals there's a structure there, there's a structure that is imposed on mm -hmm. everybody and um, one major um, kind of light bulb moment for myself mm -hmm. was um, during COVID, uh, during the lockdown, mm -hmm. uh, what was missing was um, people on the street. Um, you, the cars were missing, the people were missing, the dogs were missing, everybody, the bicycles were missing. And um, what you were able to see was the stoplights, the red, yellow, and green stoplights, the, the walk symbol, um, you were able to see the the road markings, the yellow lines, the white mm -hmm. lines, uh, the sidewalks, um, the trees, you know, um, all structure that um, regulate us in public space. 
All of these things shape our behavior in public space. Green means go, uh, red means stop, yellow means, you know, start to slow down. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. walk, or walk on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. drive on the road. It's structure. It's an imposed structure. It's not natural. <laughs> right. It doesn't in the natural world. Right. It is part of living in our um, social structures. Right. It's regulating our behavior. And um, COVID, um, you know, did it, our behavior, we were restricted. We couldn't go into that public space. We were restricted to our own homes. I produced an entire series of art. Um, oh, almost like a nostalgia for, for, you know, missing being out in public space, mm -hmm. called urban, urban organic. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that, it, it's all about structure, missing um, mm -hmm. cars that uh, come off the highway at 5 a.m. in the morning. I, you know, from, from where I was living, I heard, you know, that's the start of the workday. Mm -hmm. All of these cars coming off of the QE. Mm -hmm. Or, or the gardener, I'm not sure what it's called. Yeah, the gardener, coming off of the gardener and uh, making that humming sound. And um, it wasn't there during COVID. And there was also the, the um, you know, d d uh, morning rush hour. Right. The, uh, things just start at a certain time. Everybody just kind of piles out into the street. Mm hmm to the streetcars, onto the buses, walking, you name it, because they're all going in to work. And then it's the same thing again after work. Oh, and I, sh I should point out at lunchtime as well, too. <laughs> so right. we're regulated. And um, uh, urban organic was just a miss, like I missed that. Mm -hmm. There's a, a rhythm. <laughs> um, rhythm to everyday life that was missing during COVID. So, so yes, I had uh, dedicated an entire series to that. I also, uh, using my anthropological lens, um, I also started to think about borders uh, because of uh, what we were seeing on television during this COVID. Mm -hmm. The piece, um, Trump and his border, sorry, Trump and his border wall. Okay. Um, uh, migrants coming up from Central America. Right. And um, they were, were facing restricted um, borders. They mm -hmm. weren't allowed to cross. You know, Trump was mm -hmm. out for his border wall. Right. And um, um, I started to paint about um, these enclosed spaces, uh, spaces people could not, you know, pass through, uh, th different shapes and colors and um the, the, the theme actually was like enclosure, uh, enclosure, um, I think it was the 17th century in Britain when landowners started to fence up their properties. Um, I, I started to think about that. Okay. And that was part of my urban, uh, okay, my ordinary effects um, series, which I touched on things that make you know, the shared experiences mm -hmm. uh, that that have an impact on not just the individual, but on everybody. Right. The, everybody shares the same kind of expression. Uh, Shane shares the same kind of emotions because of a certain thing impacting everybody. And that was, you know, just seeing this refugee thing, people trying to cross the border to make a new life for themselves and were being restricted. The other thing um, I'm currently working on is migrants and migration. Um, the emancipatory experience of being able to move right. uh, restricted space. Mm -hmm. And um, I am having a blast with that one. Um, and that's something you're currently working on? That is something I'm currently, you're currently working on. So COVID really um, heightened your a sense of creativity because it seems like you had the two series that came out the mm -hmm. urban organic and then you said you had started to think about borders so your journey into art then began as a means to actually overcome writer's block which i thought was really interesting 
as well as social anxiety. So I wanted to know, given what we were just talking about, COVID being isolated and locked down, and then, you know, learning that you had writer's block um, and, and overcoming social anxiety, how has the process of creating art helped you navigate these challenges? And, and what advice might you give others who would be facing similar obstacles? Because obviously having writer's block and, and social anxiety affects many, many people. I, I have to say, um, I, okay, the, the, um, creating the art kind of um, makes you step back a little bit. Um, the kind of art that I do is abstract mm -hmm. and okay. um, abstract is, a, you know, it's almost like playing mm -hmm. and um, in order to produce effective abstract, you've got to let go of that fear and enjoy experimenting. Um, my issue was mm. um, going back and forwards between panic and procrastination. A lot of people experience that, eh? Mm -hmm. you, 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 um, because of this anxiety, mm -hmm and you name it you you go back and forward right. between oh my gosh oh my gosh i have to get this done and then there's a procrastination you can't get it done you know to, you, you, you're in such a state mm -hmm. that start trying to do something else instead of what you're supposed to be doing what i found was that my fear was um like feeling like i'm an imposter the imposter and, syndrome then. Mm -hmm. And that um, uh, I would be found out. I grew up as the dyslexic, undiagnosed dyslexic, and then later in life with the ADD. Okay. And in, you know, my, my, from my background, those are things people didn't want their children to share or their family members to share. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of hide it. Right. And, so there's always that fear of being found out. Mm -hmm. If you produce something um, not of uh, good quality, you're going to get found out. Um, the painting um, was so freeing. It's non-judgmental. Like you have to enjoy experimenting with color, textures, and um, making a mess on the paper. Like you're allowed to make a mess. I was the kid um, during Easter time. You remember um, the drugstores used to have those art coloring contests? Right. I was a messy kid. Like I couldn't draw in between the lines. Um, uh, part of dis the dyslexic, there's, well, part of the dyslexia is uh, dysgraphia in there, mm -hmm. where your handwriting is terrible. Like in, it, it's just, um, I'm going to say like a two-year-old um, painting or trying a two-year-old trying to write. Okay. With abstract, abstract is beautiful. You don't, that, that people, that's what you're trying to create. You're trying to scribble. <laughs> you're trying to not paint within the lines. Painting within the lines is almost like a conformity. You're conforming to, to what society wants you to be. Right, right. And, uh, with the abstract, you're producing art that is authentic to who you are <laughs> as a person, not somebody else. This is who you are. Uh, so it's freeing. It, it's of very course. liberating. Right. And what I would do or say to somebody else experiencing the same thing, mm -hmm. do something creative. You need to do something creative. You cannot be objective. Yes creative um, without being creative. Uh, creative, the creative process is problem solving. And as I said earlier, it's how we make sense of our world. And um, in order to make sense of our world, you need to give yourself the permission to sit back and enjoy the journey, you know, experiment. Right, try right. To try that and um, when you do that, like when you allow yourself to, you know, just enjoy the process. Right, right. It eliminates fear. So, yeah, it, it, it would, I, I'd say to 
other people experiencing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Do something. If you can bake, you can cook, um, you can sew, uh, crochet, um, garden, do something creative um, to, to, to allow yourself yes. the luxury of... Of um, course. <laughs> and, and it should be said that it's completely okay to color outside the lines and be unconventional if um if you're in the moment and and that is what you're feeling because i like what you said earlier in creating abstract art is like playing and it's where you have to let go of that fear so i think that's great advice for people that are uh, facing similar obstacles and you know your use of intuitive and tactile art forms is very intriguing can you Tell us a little bit more um, how these approaches influence your creative process and, and the message that, that you're trying to convey through your art. I, I have to, um, okay, so, so to respond to, to that question, what I would say is that um, it's first important to understand what to, intuitive and tactile art forms are. Okay. Intuitive. The intuitive uh, style of art or abstract art mm -hmm. is let the painting, the painting is basically painting itself. Like you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're bringing your um, experiences to that painting, yes, um, but you're not restricting the flow of the painting by imposing like mm. an artificial okay. structure okay. to that painting. You're letting the painting dictate where it needs to go. And uh, that, um, that's why I think of this like spiral, like a specter, <laughs> this invisible uh, force that is driving or invisible energy that is driving the painting. Mm -hmm. um, that's the intuitive part of yourself. Okay. And um, it's when, when you allow yourself to um, think intuitively, mm -hmm intuitive um it, it's also freeing like you you tap into your your authentic self you, you're tapping into something a little bit um more than who you are and i'm going to use the word it's almost spiritual as well too okay okay and that's the intuitive and what about the tactile side of it with the tactile the mm -hmm. tactile is um like it opposes like a sense of touch like it, tactile is um, a tactile art. And there's like a texture to it mm -hmm. that makes you want to touch it, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's almost like a taboo when you think about art. Uh, <laughs> yes. art uh, you're not supposed to touch. You're supposed to stand back. There's mm -hmm. um, this barrier between you and the art, and if you try to get close to one of the master, um, well, the classical. Uh, well-known classical paintings, mm -hmm. you're most likely going to get arrested. <laughs> With mm -hmm. tactile, tactile art forms make sure you want to touch it. If there's a texture to it. It there's sure does. Yeah. Inviting you to touch it. So what I say to everybody, you know, like when I'm standing there and I'm presenting my art at mm -hmm. exhibitions or art fairs, I tell people to touch it. You know, it's got layers of um, the the varnish on it. Mm -hmm. So it can be white, you know, like the art can be white. Okay. And you're okay with that? You, you, yeah, I'm okay with that. Touch it. Uh, yeah. Reach out, touch it, uh, because you're allowed. It's not going to, to disintegrate. Right, right. And when people are engaged with art on that level, mm -hmm. it's more meaningful as well. Oh, I completely agree. It really does make a huge difference. And and I know that you've mentioned turning your, your disadvantages into advantages through painting and I'm wondering if you could maybe share with us a specific instance where you felt this particular transformation most profoundly reflected in your work I I um okay so uh growing up dyslexic I I learned to um overcome my challenges mm -hmm. uh, through workarounds like I do things differently always I was um when somebody tells you to think outside the box mm -hmm. 
I, I, my response back is, you know what, I have never been in the box, you know, I've always had to do things differently. Um, growing up, my challenge was learning. So I had to basically learn differently from everybody else, mm -hmm. how to learn differently. Mm -hmm. And um, it took quite a lot of effort, but um, it has made me competitive in um, well, it made me competitive from a business sense, in a business sense. Mm -hmm. And in my artwork, um, it has, like I've developed my own stuff. This is my style. Nobody else paints like I do uh, because I have a hard time following exact instructions. It always turns out to be something completely different than what um, the art instructor was telling me to do. Right, right. And so then you have found your own uniqueness you got in it. your style of art, right? That's correct. It is. This is my style. Um, mm. I've seen other people copy what I do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, really unique. When people start to copy you, it's like amazing. Um, it's the ultimate compliment, though, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I um, use, you know, the under padding of carpets as a form of texture uh, to texturize the paint mm -hmm. and now I'm seeing that pop up all over the place eh? mm. and once people figured out what I was using they they you know they're enjoying including it into their own artwork mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so dyslexia and ADD are often viewed as hindrances yet you have found a way to leverage them in your own artistic expression. So I wonder how you think embracing the differences has really contributed to the uniqueness of your artistic voice. I, I um, okay, so when you say embracing my differences, yes, uh, I am, like, it, it, it's, I, I, would she, I'd say leverage, um, I'm leveraging these differences. Okay. Um, I am leveraging them by not trying to restrict them. And continue learning. And continue learning. I'm, I'm not trying to restrict them. I'm, I'm right. using them right. um, to create my own style of art. Right. And by doing that, it's nobody else can produce what I produce. This is me. They, mm -hmm. they can mm -hmm. some of my techniques. Mm -hmm. They won't have the same. Like they will. They will never have the same finished products as I. Right. I get it. My art will always be. You know, this is Audra style. Yes, of course. And I, I've seen a little bit of your work, and I think it is really just. It's so beautiful, so different, definitely unique. You have your own style, as all artists do. Um, but there's just something very interesting about the pieces that you create. I mean, your your artwork is is characterized by um, a, a a very dense network of uh, crisscrossing lines. It has varied uh, shapes and like um, earthy textures. So I'm just wondering what draws you to these particular elements and and what are you hoping viewers will experience when they're engaging with your pieces i i um I mean, i'm just going back to what i said about uh, movement and space mm, okay mm -hmm. and, um uh two themes in there um being able to move freely through space and right. also being restricted. I started when I first started to paint and, you know, going through the lockdown during COVID. Right. It was, um, we were restricted. We weren't able to move freely through space. Uh -huh. And um, the way I was, like I kept drawing boxes and lines and um, in, in between of those different boxes were different colors and when you think of the paintings um, as if you were looking down onto like a landscape, mm -hmm. 
you'd see the land all carved into these different parcels um, that belong to other people, the restricted spaces, eh? And um, I did uh, quite a lot of that. That, that I'm going to say, was a psychological. That was um, a psychological manifestation of mm, okay. our um, situation at the time of COVID. Now it's... Um, my thoughts are, land, you know, they landed on being able to move freely. The feeling of joy of being able to move freely through these different uh, spaces. Mm -hmm. And in order to express that, it's fluid. You know, like you have to show fluid kind of mo uh, movement in the paintings. And um, that has, you know, it, it, it's... it's um, it's easy for me to paint because it, it, it's an expression of joy <laughs> when mm -hmm. I'm painting these things. Okay. Like, like a celebration. Oh, I love that. Like a celebration. And so I'm wondering then, because you've pretty much walked us through your creative process, but would you say that your creative process is one that's reflective for you that's going back to the source where your inspiration is coming from to bring your art that you're feeling to life. Because, and I say reflective, because you've talked about the nostalgia series that was created during COVID. You've talked about um, where you started thinking about um, borders during this time, painting those enclosed spaces. And then even now with what you're onto, uh, migrants and migration, would you say that your creative process is reflective from that initial spark of in inspiration to your finished artwork I, I i i like the term reflective i would agree i'm mm -hmm. going to say yes and um, i would expand on that as well too by saying that uh, um yes i am reflective uh reflecting on uh the present i'm reflecting on what's currently happening um around me mm -hmm. in the world i'm also um, thinking about that and comparing it. I'm also comparing it to the past. I'm also a Jamaican family historian. <laughs> oh, are you? I didn't know that. Okay. I'm an um, avid Jamaican family historian. I've been uh, researching my family history since mm. uh, 2010. And um, I, a lot of work was done with my grandmother, um, learning about my grandmother's family. Mm, okay. And um, so I reflect back on what I've learned, what I've heard from her, and also compare it to what's currently happening now. And um, I'm going to say there's a bit of nostalgia in there as well, too. Not something, not based on my own lived experiences, but the lived experiences of my ancestors, what they experienced. There's the, when I say the nostalgia, I'm, um, thinking a little bit more analytical I'm, I'm doing that comparison mm -hmm. and um, I am also uh, thinking about um, how the past and the present is informing me um, how it informs myself how it informs my art what I want to turn around and teach somebody else Okay. Uh, so the, it's that new. It's reflective. Like I'm reflecting on the the, the right. past and the present. I'm mm -hmm. analyzing that. I'm um, and then presenting something, presenting like a new narrative. <laughs> yes. It, it, would you say that's how you maintain a sense of balance between the intuition and technique? Because I'm I'm curious say. about that. When I, I I look at your work, there <sighs> there's just something that always looks. So I don't, what's the right word? Maybe the right word is measured. It's almost like it's me okay. measured, but I think that just comes intuitively. It, it's okay. So, so uh, there is that intuitive nature mm -hmm. to the artwork. The intuitiveness is in, is definitely there. Mm -hmm. The balance is what makes a good story. Mm, okay. When you see um, how the composition is put together, uh -huh. there's like an, I, I have to um, guide the viewer through the painting in order for them to understand the story that I'm trying to tell them, oh, or okay. for them to, to 
take away their own interpretation of the painting. Right, the, right. The, the guidance. So the, um, the balance is done with color. Um, it, it's done with the color. You've got your tint tone and your uh, tint tone and shade. Mm -hmm. You've got um, your uh, very intense colors. You've got your very um, light kind of colors, my blue. Um, my yellow, my, um, what else is in there? Uh, it's almost like an orangey, like peachy kind of an orangey color. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's done with the, the, the balance of colors and it's also done with the positioning. Um, it, it's my earlier paintings were all across the board. Um, it was, they were horizontal. Um, and when I say horizontal, it's, you know, they covered the entire canvas and you're basically going from left to right. My new compositions are about movement, space, and they're swimming. There's almost like a um, okay. to, to the composition. So you're swimming, you're moving through this, uh, this um, I'm going to say the negative white space. And when I say negative white space, um, when I think about migrants and migration, it's um, there's like a freedom in the painting. There's it's emancipating to be able to move mm -hmm. through what was once restricted right. space, restricted to white Europeans, and um, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's there's a joy, but there, there's. Um, yeah, almost like a celebration. You, yeah. you bring it back to joy and, and celebration. And I find that um, quite beautiful. And I know that your paintings, just from the little that I have seen, they, they seem to offer both a physical and a, a visual stimulation to viewers. So I, I wanted to know how you approach that interplay between the, the sensory experiences in your work. I I um, I really uh, pay a lot of attention to that the the physical and the visual, mm -hmm. and um, I I want to ensure the person is engaged um, from not just um, like the visual perspective, but also from the point where yes they can touch the painting, they can see like there's something there. Um, there's a kind of texture there. Mm -hmm. They should be able to touch it. Um, so it's basically offering them. Like it, it, the painting needs to have that kind of um, character. Um, oh, I like that. Yes, that's a great word for it. Character. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, not just like the visual texture, but there's physical texture. Yes, of course. And it's like hitting all the modalities, whether it's a visual, we don't have auditory here, but you've got that sense of touch as well as the visual aspects, right? Exactly. I did um, a sponsored paint um, through this, I'm going to say corporation. They produced a set of paints that um, had a smell to them as well. <laughs> okay. Made from natural um, ingredients. Okay. Uh, mostly fruits. So when you stop oh. the orange, the orange is not like orange. <laughs> okay. But, uh, so so it it would be nice um, to to have more opportunities like that in order to include include more sensory experiences within the painting. I also okay that that would be the sense of smell you get the sense of smell. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I also like to try, you know, describing the painting. Um, nowadays, when you are having a meeting, City of Toronto has um, their staff describe, you know, what is happening in their, you know, on their Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. I, uh, mm, it's it's an audio. It's really interesting to experience because it, it it's uh, kind of um, distracting as well too. Mm -hmm. 
when, when, you, when you're having a Zoom meeting and then the meeting's also being described, what the person looks like is being described. And, uh, but I think once people get used to things like that, right. it adds a different layer of... Um, Definitely adds another layer. Yeah, Definitely. and I think that that's needed. Um, if yeah. uh, somebody else yes. get touch in there, right. uh, there's an opportunity to include smell. There's also an opportunity to include the, the, the sound, like the audio. And that, the, that's quite interesting. I think we have a lot of open... Uh, a lot of opportunities open to us, and I think we yes. just have to use them. Yes, I agree. I completely agree. And, you know, as someone who offers commissioned pieces, Audra, how do you navigate the fine line between capturing a client's vision and then maintaining your own artistic integrity? Like, can you share maybe any memorable experiences from working on any commissions? Does anything come to mind? Oh, there's a lot of things that come to me. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, okay, so so here is um, okay. To be frank, yes, I've not done a commission piece as yet. Uh huh. I approached to do many commission pieces. Okay. And um, I've been stumped. Um, mm. Oh, can you paint that man for my my three year old son's birthday party? Okay. My dog. Can you, can you paint a portrait? Mm -hmm. Can you do all sorts of, uh, these things that I don't do? Mm -hmm. Do you find that and sense of anxiousness wells up inside you? It, it does. It, uh, <laughs> yeah. to, to just to test how serious a person is about what they want me to paint. Yes. There's this nice thing called an artist contract. <laughs> And when I say, okay, I will try to do that for you, Let, let's put an artist contract together to see, you know, um, what we can agree to right. before I actually start painting. And um, yeah, before I start painting, and then after I finish painting, you saying, that's not what I wanted. So when I talk to them about putting together the artist agreement for the painting, they shut down because it's too much work. It's too much uh, um, of a bother for them to go through. It's not just, you know, me, them asking me to. Right. Mission. Yeah. And, and contracts are there for a reason. And, and yeah. that very reason. That's, um, I think, uh, something that can be an absolute saving grace so that you're not wasting your time and you're not putting yourself in a situation where you actually are being... Uh, creative and, and not giving somebody quite what they were hoping for. So um, avoiding situations like that at all costs, I think contracts are great for that. Mm -hmm. I, I will get my commission piece. I, I am open <laughs> to it. Um, uh, I, yeah. But the I'm right time, to... the right one is going to come along and you're going to jump at the chance because you're just going to know it's the right thing to do. Exactly, exactly. So tell me, where can we see you exhibit next? I've got, um, okay, so so I am, I put in my submission for the Halton Black History Awareness Society. I'm hoping to be mm -hmm. exhibiting there in uh, okay. July through, oh, what are we, we are, oh, That'll be the end of July, probably going into early September. That's for the Emancipation Art um, Exhibition. So, so uh, looking that. forward to to definitely having you um, go through that process. And hopefully we'll see some of your pieces um, at the Helsin Gallery in, in Halton Hills. Yeah, so that's one of the places. And is there anywhere prior to July? Okay, so, so uh, prior to July... There is an Artscape Young Place, uh, Bear mm. Town. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I love Artscape. Mm -hmm. I want to participate in their event. I'm in the process of putting out uh, my application for that. Oh, lovely. The events were phenomenal. It, it's almost, <laughs> um, I'm going to say street level um, engagement with the Toronto mm -hmm. Arts community. Fabulous. And also energizing. Always, always, always energizing. So I, I always love participating in that. Um, there is another, um, event I'm 
preparing for, but that doesn't happen until August. Um, it goes from August through September, uh-huh. and it's my solo. Like it's my solo oh, okay. exhibit with the Black Artists Network. Oh, great! And, and gallery, mm-hmm. and uh, they're at the four hundred one Richmond Street West uh, building. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a collection of. It's almost like mm-hmm. an artist. Um, Richmond and Spadina. Uh, I will be showing about, I'm going to say over like 30 pieces. It, it's a big one. Um, I will be there. Wow, yeah, so, that is a big one. I will be producing these mammoth big paintings uh, for that exhibit um, over, I'm going to say about over 24 by 48 inches. Okay. Or, and um, I received a Canada Arts Council grant for that, plus a Toronto Arts Council grant. Good for you. <laughs> Fabulous. This is uh, paintings, this mm-hmm. mammoth, uh, epic storytelling type paintings. So I'm looking forward to that. It sounds like you're going to be very busy over the next few months, right through the summer, actually, because uh, that's three um very very busy exhibits especially with your solo so wishing you all the best with that and just tell us before we wrap this up Audra where could we find you online if anybody is um, on my website or the RS feeds um, you can certainly see that in the um, link itself but where can we find you online online I, I, um, I have a website my okay. website is Audra T dot com mm-hmm. i am also on instagram okay great in uh, search uh using audra townsend or art by audra t fabulous well there's an awful lot of uh places where you're going to pop up online with just a general google search which is great audra it's been an absolute pleasure uh speaking with you today and and to our listeners thank you for tuning in to be inspired your ultimate resource for finding inspiration if you are an artist with a story to tell then i invite you to connect with me until next time stay inspired and keep creating and again audra thank you so much you're welcome and thank you for having me